Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to join the group. It's the first time I actually attend a conference in this group and happy birthday, Tony. Um, so I will uh, start with some geometric uh, reform or well, formulation, classical formulation of Lefschetz properties. And I will also move in the geometric and topological direction to see how one can fix the scalar package in the cases when it fails. Um, I will leave it to you as an exercise to extract the algebra of this picture and maybe at the next conference we'll have some uh, new results about perverse shifts in the algebraic setting. All right, so let me start just with the killer package. We saw this already in the previous talk in the algebraic setting. So let me just quickly overview the geometry behind it. So uh, I will focus on complex projective manifolds for now. And let me work with the cohomology with uh, com complex coefficients. And as it's classically known, this satisfies Poincare duality. So cohomologies in complementary degrees are dual to each other. So in particular, Betty numbers of complementary degrees are equal. Um, there is a Hodge structure on the cohomology in each uh, degree, which is in this case pure of weight given by the index of the cohomology. So this means that, well, um, besides the you can formulate it in terms of the Hodge filtration, but let me just say that this is essentially given by the Durham cohomology. So the PQ type decomposition of forms. And as a consequence, again, a topological consequence is that the odd Betty numbers, uh, such a killer manifold are even. Then moving to uh, the Lefschetz properties, we have weak Lefschetz which is also called uh, Lefschetz hyperplane theorem in topology and geometry. So this says that if I have a generic hyperplane in the ambient projective space, then the restriction homomorphism from the <clears throat> projective variety X to its hyperplane section is an isomorphism up to middle. So for the index less than N minus one and it's injective in degree and minus one. And if you notice, an easy consequence of this is that at, at least in dimension two and higher, this would imply the generic hyperplane sections of the variety X are connected. I'm listing this uh, topological consequences because this is it's very easy to see on particular examples why the killer package fails here and there by simply checking this, uh, this or seeing how this, this, this kind of consequences fail. And of course, there is hard left sheds, which we saw already a lot here. So for a generic hyperplane, there is an isomorphism given by um, copying with certain powers of, let me state it topologically, of the Poincare dual of a hyperplane section. Um, so we're moving from degree, so, oops, what did I do? I didn't do something good here. Wow, oh, you know this. How did I? Uh, don't talk, okay. <laughs> All right, so there was a, yeah, this one. So uh, N was a dimension of the um, projective manifold and we're moving from N minus K to N plus K by copying with the Kth power of this um, churn class of a, an ample bundle, if you like. All right, so in particular, the Betty numbers, uh, of our x are unimodal uh, before below the middle degree. All right. So now, of course, these are left sheds. I'm not going to put this on the slide, but it implies the left sheds decompo primitive decomposition. And then you have uh, Hodge Riemann relations, which we already saw earlier. And um, 
what I want to, to move to is uh, maybe just to give you an early application or maybe combinatorial application of this package because these are, as Matt said, typically you see this kind of results applied in combinatorics nowadays on a regular basis. And towards the end of the talk, I'll give you some more examples, which were not mentioned yet, but they are somehow in the same spirit of what you've seen already. But um, for example, I don't remember if this is in Stanley's a, uh, ICM talk, but I saw it somewhere in Stanley's notes maybe. If you started the Grassmann manifold, so just D planes in CN, this is a complex projective manifold of complex dimension, well, D being the, uh, coming from plane, the dimension of the planes times N minus D. Um, it is known that this is an algebraic cell decomposition, so it's styled by complex affine spaces. So in particular, the odd Betty numbers vanish. And the even Betty numbers are computed combinatorially by these partitions of the, well, half of the cohomological index by, um, well, partitions whose Young diagram fit into a certain box, size D times N minus D. So these are combinatorial meanings for um, the Betty numbers of the Grassmann manifold. And now using the killer package for the, let's say for these Betty numbers, you get right away that this sequence of partitions of numbers from zero to D times M, N minus D, um, whose Young diagram fit in the uh, boxes of the respective sizes, D times N minus D, is symmetric and unimodal. So typically you see this kind of problems stated backwards, right? So I, I start with geometry and I derive the combinatorial consequence, but usually you see these things in combinatorics being stated like this is a finite set of numbers, show them they have such and such properties. And the typical approach is to actually, well, this is already visible in Stanley's work, is to actually come up with a geometric space that realizes those numbers as Betty numbers or something related to the cohomology of that space and then using the Keller package on the cohomology on something or something adjacent to it, you should be able to derive whatever properties you want for these numbers. And we'll see this, this kind of uh, principle towards the end as well. Please feel free to, in, to interrupt. I may have a tendency to speak fast, maybe not as fast as Italians, but still. Um, <laughs> I come from that general area. Uh, all right, so there are other versions of our left sheds or um, Keller packages, also in what's called the non-abelian setting. So in this case, you replace the constant coefficients by a semi-simple local system. So semi-simple representations of the fundamental group. Let me not state that. Um, precisely, I'll get back to it later. So this was due to Simpson in 1992. Um, and of course, there are Eladic versions for varieties defined over finite fields. This was done by Delin and so on. So I, I'll not necessarily get to, I don't care about finite fields for now, but this non-abelian version, this, this local system um, situation will pop up later. Now, what do you do for singular varieties, right? So everything I said so far is true for uh, complex projective manifolds or Keller manifolds, if you like, but what do you do uh, in the singular case? Well, you may look for spaces whose cohomology has the Keller package, or um, you may study, I don't know, in case you know there is the Keller package exists. You may study this non-Keller lo non um, Lefschetz locus, for example, or you may change the theory entirely to actually recover the Keller package if it doesn't work for the usual cohomology. And I will try to um, state a general principle that says that, well, by changing coefficients, 
and working under a big umbrella, you can actually do a lot more at once. But this is a topological or geometrical situation. So as I said, it remains to extract the algebra out of it and coming up with um, something of the sort that we saw in Matt's talk early. All right, so here is an easy example in case there are students or junior people here who haven't seen topology much. This is perhaps one of, one of the first examples where you see why everything fails in the singular world. So I just take two copies of CP2 connected at the, well, meeting at the point in, in, in CP4, and I even wrote the equations for you. And now it's very easy to calculate, I don't know, um, undergrads can calculate the cohomology of this uh, space. And I actually did that, uh, worked out the exercise for you. So my Viatoris tells us what the cohomology is right away. Uh, but I want to explain a little bit what the story is here, because I want to show you how to fix the, um, the failure of the killer package in a minute. So in this case, if you look at H0, I said that's rank one, and of course it is rank, I mean, it should be because it's a connected picture, but you may wonder, well, I have two zero cycles, two distinguished zero cycles here, the points A and B in this picture, and why are they not giving me uh, different things? Of course, they co-bound the one chain, uh, this thickened curve going through the singular point P. So being, endpoints of a one chain, they give you the same homology or cohomology class. But on the other hand, I mean, not on the other hand, um, you may also see that if I take a generic hyperplane in CP4 and I take um, the slice of, of this singular space by that generic hyperplane, I get something disconnected. So this shows you again that, well, something is wrong with the killer package. In this case, the weak left just fails because I have this section which is not connected. Um, again, directly from the calculation, ranks in degree zero and four are not equal. So both Poincare duality and hard left should fail. All right, so what do you do in this case? I mean, this is one of the situations where nothing works, right? Forget about, um, you know, non, non left just locus or things like this. All right, so, um, well, uh, the story here is that H0 and H4 look different and you'd like to, well, correct this theory to make them look alike. So how do you correct the theory? Well, um, I would like to separate the points A and B as zero cycles which means I would like to avoid using this cycle, this, this uh, chain delta. So that chain should somehow not be there. So to restore the killer package in the singular setting, geometers, topologists use uh, intersection cohomology. And this is a theory of allowable chains. So these are chains which um, are somewhat restricted. Um, this allowability is controlling the, what's called the defect of transversality of intersections of chains with the singularities of, of the space. And uh, in our picture earlier, I'm not gonna define intersection homology for you, but um, let me just say that one chains in the picture I, I worked with earlier are not allowed to pass through the singularities. So that one chain delta, that thick, chain connecting the zero cycles A and B is not allowed, which says that in this new theory, what did I do? The other way, sorry. In this new theory, A and B give me um, different cycles. So delta is not allowed. All right, so here's a general um, statement about intersection calculation of intersection homology for spaces with isolated singularities. Again, this is something that's very easy to do by hand, just following the definitions, but you see, for example, 
here that um, in the lowest half of the degrees, I'm kind of, I'm avoiding change in the singular locus. So I get just the cohomology of the regular part. You can do intersection homology or intersection cohomology by using chains. And this is the first definition of Goretzky McPherson. Or you can use what's called constructible sheaves. That's the souped-up version. And um, it's also much more powerful because it has connections to algebraic geometry as well and representation theory and all these things that you'll see in a minute. In that sense, we say that intersection cohomology is computed by what's called an IC complex. So this is a complex of sheaves of vector spaces. Let's say complex vector spaces here. Um, it is uniquely characterized in what's called the derived category of constructible complexes by a set of axioms. And it's simply, in, in, in layman's term, it's just an extension of the constant shift from the regular locus of the variety um, to the whole space in a suitable sense that will actually satisfy the killer package. So this is like the optimal um, extension of the constant shift from the smooth locus of the variety to the singular, uh, to the singular variety itself, which restores the killer package. All right, so when I say intersection cohomology is calculated by uh, this IC complex, I mean, I mean complexes of sheaves of cohomology groups just like regular sheaves. And this is called hypercohomology. That's why I use the bold H, but don't worry too much about it. You calculate them as usual in terms of resolutions and things like this. And there is, a, by definition, this is a convention. There are many conventions in this theory, but this is one of them. I shift uh, the cohomological degree by the uh, complex dimension. OK. So as I said, this IC complex is defined in the derived category by a set of axioms, which are derived from the chain definition, local chain definition of intersection homology. And um, there is a notion of duality in this derived category called the Verdier duality, which is just an instance of uh, moving between cohomology and cohomology compact support. And checking axioms for this dual of the IC complex, you get quickly, really quickly, a version of Poincare duality for this intersection homology. So let me say, maybe I should say that, of course, for a smooth space, this intersection homology is just homology or cohomology, right? Because I said this IC complex is just an extension of the constant sheaf on the regular locus. But if everything is already smooth, then that's it. It's just a constant sheaf. Again, up to a shift, but let's not worry too much about shifts. Um, OK, so if my variety is now smooth, you recover the statement of Poincare duality for the smooth projective variety. All right. Sorry. So this is just the Poincare duality. Of course, everything else, I mean, of course, everything else works for intersection cohomology, but maybe not as easy. Uh, and I want to try to run through the statements, the remaining four pieces of the killer package, and maybe indicate what the main principle is. So weak left sheds holds more generally than the IC story. It holds for what's called the perverse sheaf. So this IC complexes are the prototypes for perverse sheaves. So these are some complexes of sheaves, which are essentially um, the analog of local systems on a singular space. So the statement of weak left shifts for perverse sheaves, so you can just think of it as being just a complex of sheaves with some nice vanishing properties. And the statement of weak left shifts in this case is 
for any hyperplane section in a complex projective variety, the restriction of a perverse shift to that section induces, well, this is the analog of the restriction map we saw earlier in, uh, in, in cohomology. And this is an isomorphism in degrees less than minus one and an injection in degree minus one. You'll notice now that I'm shifting already from n minus one to minus one, and this is due when I work with intersection cohomology to that shift in the way I define intersection cohomology from the IC complex. Anyways, this has nothing to do yet with the IC. It's just a statement about uh, cohomology of a perverse sheaf and its restriction to, a, to any hyperplane section, generic or not. And this is, of course, Um, yeah, maybe let me say what's behind this. And this is the main principle I want to emphasize. So the whole story here is not about um, let me put a positive spin on it. I, I learned a while back that it's not nice to say in a talk something not, is not that. Let's just say is something else. That's the counter. <laughs> so um, the emphasis here is that to, to obtain the weak left sheds, um, you need to work with a perverse sheaf, for example, the AC complex, on an affine variety. So this is the analog of saying, if I work with an affine, complex affine variety, the CW complex, uh, the, the CW complex that records the homotopy type of that affine variety is, is very nice. As, real dimension given by the complex dimension of the variety. So this is exactly an instance of that topological principle. If I work with an affine variety, in this case, just the complement of the section, and perverse shifts restrict nicely to open subsets. So if I restrict the perverse shift on X to this open um, U, I still get the perverse shift. Then the cohomology with compact support of that perverse sheaf on the affine variety is zero in negative degrees. So this is called the Artin vanishing theorem. And I'm not sure there is a, I haven't seen it yet in your talks as a principle towards studying this uh, Artinian Gorenstein algebras. All right, so we'll come back to this, but the essence is always to kind of cook up the right perverse sheaf and then maybe figure out what this restriction to, to the section, to the hyperplane section is. So let me give you some instances now of all sorts, which are special cases of this result. If I now choose a generic hyperplane section, like we all like to do, then um, the perverse shift, which I already saw, it restricts to perverse shifts on the open complement of the section, it also restricts to a perverse shift now on the section itself up to a cohomological shift. So for example, the IC complex restricted to our um, generic hyperplane section now, it's just an IC complex again up to a cohomological shift. So this gives the weak left shift result for intersection uh, cohomology and it's, it's, again, this is a very easy argument here. And let me just state it, it's exactly, I stated here what it means to be generic, but don't worry too much about witness stratifications. So generic in any sense you like for a, a, a hyperplane section will give you the respective isomorphisms, respectively monomorphism for the restriction morphism of intersection cohomology. So again, if X was smooth, then you recover the left shed cyberplane section in the classical case. All right, so I actually, I think I just copied the previous result, putting an I in front. But now there are other instances where things behave nicely. So let's just do weak left sheds for cohomology now. Forget about intersection cohomology. I said I work with perverse sheaves, so this gives me the freedom to choose any coefficients I like, and in particular, it may happen that the constant sheaf itself is a perverse sheaf. So um, let's work now with 
a hyperplane section which contains a singular locus, right? And then I, well, the claim is, this is again a classical statement, but this is an easy proof of it, that the inclusion of this kind of special hyperplane section that contains a singular locus induces the standard isomorphisms in cohomology, just like the general hyperplane sections would do in the smooth case. And the reason now is, I told you that the principle was Artin's vanishing theorem on the affine um, hyperplane section complement. And here, well, it is well known that, well, I said local systems are the prototypes of perverse shifts up to some cohomological shifts. In this case, even the constant shift, I mean, this is the nicest local system, of course, is a perverse shift on this affine uh, uh, hyperplane section complement. So I can apply art in vanishing to it, and I get exactly uh, just working with um, the constant shift, even though the constant shift on the ambient space X is not perverse, its restriction to, to this open is perverse, and this is the principle that gives us weak left shifts. Now, there are other cases where the constant shift is actually perverse on the ambient space, so this is exactly, ex excuse my, um, I, I got ahead of myself and I put my name up there. Of course, this is just the classical left shifts. Um, so in case I have a hypersurface or, or even a local complete intersection, uh, the constant shift, again, up to a cohomological shift, satisfies all these properties of a, of a perverse shift. So then the inclusion of any hyperplane, any hyperplane section will give you uh, the classical isomorphisms that you see in weak left shifts, um, the weak left shifts theory. So this is the case of hypersurfaces. This is very special, the fact that um, the constant sheaf or a local system on a hypersurface or, or a on a local complete intersection is always a perverse sheaf. This is the part that we did. Well, you may wonder what happens at the other end of the story of the spectrum. So below the middle degree, you get these isomorphisms given by the uh, weak left shifts, but what do you do at the other half? And in geometry, things are a bit more complicated. And this is where our contribution uh, comes in. So if you work with a reduced type of surface, let's say with a uh, singular locus of complex dimension S, and I work with a generic section, then this relative cohomology, which measures, um, which measures when uh, this restriction morphism is, is isomorphism or monomorphism or whatever, so this, co this relative cohomology vanishes in, in degrees close to the top. So this is something that this doesn't, this uses just plain topology, really homotopy theory. But it has quite nice applications. Uh, for example, it can be used to prove this all result of Cato, which again holds for complete intersections, that says if I work, let me state it for hypersurfaces, if I work with a hypersurface of, uh, let's say, well, in Pn plus 1, with S being the complex dimension of the singular locus, then um, that hypersurface is the same cohomology, even with, Z co even with integer coefficients, as the ambient projective space in degrees less than half and also towards the top in a range controlled by the dimension of the singular locus. There is always this ambiguity from the middle to n plus dimension of the singular locus plus one, where we don't know what the cohomology of a hypersurface is, and this is something that I could state as an open problem. In fact, if we knew, even in the case of hypersurfaces with isolated singularities, there are two cohomology groups in the middle and the one above middle, where we don't know the Betty numbers. And if we actually knew that, we would, for example, solve this problem that everybody likes in arrangement uh, theory of calculating Betty numbers of mineral fibers for central hyperplane arrangement. All right. Unfortunately, the technology we have does not allow us yet to 
make any progress on this calculation. Let me move to hard left shift. So hard left shift is much more complicated. Um, the known proofs, at least for the intersection homology, cohomology, go through work of Bailinson, Bernstein, Delin, and Saito, who brought up uh, Hosh theory into the picture. And then Cataldo Milerini have also proved more, uh, a more elementary proof. Um, and hard left shift usually comes up in a package uh, with what's called the decomposition theorem. So I'm not gonna get to that. I'm not gonna mention anything about that, but these things come together usually. Um, so there is a decomposition theorem and this hard left shifts, relative hard left shifts uh, theorem for projective morphism. So it's a relative version of hard left shifts. But if you apply it to the constant map to a point, you get the usual hard left shifts for intersection cohomology, which let me just state it here, is the same story as for cohomology. But now you see, I emphasized here in parentheses that intersection cohomology is not a ring, but a module over cohomology. So you see, I'm using intersection cohomology here in the statement of our left sheds, but I'm copying with the cohomology class, the, stat, the usual story, the, the, the first chunk class of an ample line bundle. So, well, as a consequence, intersection cohomology, Betty numbers are unimodal, just like we saw it for the classical cohomology. But um, again, if X is smooth, you get back the classical proof of, of hard left shifts. And I have to say there are, in topology and geometry, there are some easier proofs of hard left shifts. The classical hard left shifts using maybe the I don't know, Poincaré duality and um, weak left shifts and induction and things like this. So I, I can give you a reference if you're interested to, to see that. Um, okay. All right, here I put a quick application because you also have, of course, once you have hard left shifts, you have this uh, primitive left shifts decomposition, you have Hodge Riemann relations. Again, you have the, everything works in this setting as well. And in this case, I assume this was known before, but we didn't see it in the literature. So we extended this classical Hodge index theorem for Keller manifolds to the singular setting by simply um, well using uh, what's called the what are these things called um, graded Hodge Hodge left shift modules or something like this. So for any graded hard left shift module or structure, um, this, the corresponding signature is calculated in terms of uh, the intersection, the, the, the Hodge numbers. In this case, the intersection homology um, Hodge numbers. And uh, I should say that, again, uh, this IC complex that calculates intersection cohomology comes with more structure, right? It comes with um, this structure of, of Saito, of mixed Hosh modules. So Hodge structures are in the play. So this intersection cohomology groups also have Hodge structures. And this allows me to, uh, to define corresponding Hodge numbers and a certain combination of them calculates the signature, which was defined topologically by Goresk McPherson. So this is just an extension of the classical um, Hodge index theorem, and I thought it's a cute application of the um, Keller package. All right, so further generalization. So the first, uh, the first, the, the, the most general statement uh, out there for hard left shifts is, was given by Moshizuki. Um, and it applies to semi-simple perverse sheaves, so in particular, semi-simple representations in the case when your variety was smooth. Uh, so this, this embeds in it all previous statements of the hard left shift theorem. So if I have a perverse sheaf, which is semi-simple, so this category of perverse sheaves is, is quite nice. It's an abelian, artinian, and Euterian category and it's semi-simple, it's look like IC complexes. 
shifted by, uh, twisted by some irreducible representations of the fundamental group of the regular locus, if you like. But there is a statement uh, of this sort which uh, gives you hard left shifts for any semi-simple perverse shift. And again, copying with um, the first chunk class of, uh, of an ample line bundle on X. All right. So, yeah, this is already, this is, I already said this extends both classical and uh, non abelian versions of our left shifts. And this was done not too long ago, maybe seven, eight years ago, and it's, it's the proof is much more complicated than the, what we've seen before. All right, let me move to applications uh, quickly, some applications. So there are tons of applications, and we saw in the last 10 years or so, many more coming in combinatorics. So um, geometry and topology, I hope I gave you a few earlier. Algebra, we see a lot of them here in this conference. Combinatorics, we already saw a few. Let me, well, mention again, McMullen's G conjecture, um, Dowling, Wilson, Rota conjectures, and so on. Uh, representation theory, Kazan, Lustig conjecture, and the nice thing is that this geometric, uh, the, the geometric intuition, the geometric results motivated the development of combinatorial theories, like combinatorial intersection cohomology theories for convex polytops by, uh, let's say, by Carew and uh, Bracelet, Fisler, Kaup, and then uh, for matroids by many people in the group of Jun Ha and his collaborators. And I want to actually just end with one quick example which complements what Matt talked about, right? So if you use the hodge riemann relations, you get low concavity type results. But if you use the hard left shoots, you, you, you tend to, and, and, and this kind of uh, unimodality of, of Betty numbers, um, you get, well, just, you replicate properties of, I don't know, Hodge num or Betty numbers of uh, smooth projective varieties, right? So let me start with a very simple application. Let me just work in the complex world. You can do these things also illogically, but let me not get there. So in the complex, for a complex projective variety, let's say of pure dimension N, and let's assume it has an algebraic cell decomposition. So these things appear a lot in representation theory. They appear all over the place, right? So these are those, uh, for example, quotients of semi-simple Lie groups by parabolic subgroups. Those would be nice cases. So in this case, you don't, and this may be singular, so you don't necessarily have hard left shifts, but the Betty numbers in, in this complementary degrees behave in a nice way. So this is like what's called top heavy behavior, right? So the Betty numbers towards the end are higher than the Betty numbers in the first half. And in com this is in complementary degrees. And the, state, the, 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 the proof of this statement is, is actually a very nice and quite easy application of the formalism of hard left shits. So first of all, harsh theory we're using, for example, a resolution of singularities you can show that the map from cohomology to intersection cohomology is always injective. So there is always a map from the constant shift to the IC complex, which gives you this map from cohomology to intersection cohomology. And the kernel of this map always lies in the part of the cohomology of X with weights less than the index of cohomology you're looking at. So if I look at HK, the kernel will, will, will land in the weights less than less or equal k minus one but this algebraic cell decomposition it's an easy exercise to see that the cohomology groups of an algebra of a space with an algebraic cell decomposition always have a, a harsh structure of pure tate type so um, this will tell you there is no kernel all right so this map from cohomology to intersection cohomology is injective 
So then I simply write down the diagram, the hard left diagram for both cohomology and intersection cohomology. Standard arguments show you this is a commutative diagram. On the right hand side, I have hard left sheets for intersection cohomology, and this is an isomorphism. Horizontal arrows are injections, so this will force the left and the left vertical arrow, uh, down arrow, to be injective as well. So this will prove this kind of top heaviness of um, Betty numbers of this kind of varieties which have an algebraic cell decomposition. So this was used, maybe I should get to this. So there are these nice combinatorial conjectures from the 70s of Doling, Wilson, and Rota. So the, let me just briefly state this in um, what's called the realizable case for matroids. So this was stated for matroids, but I want to just keep it geometric here. So let me just take the set a spanning subset of an n-dimensional complex vector space. The spanning subset has d elements. And now look at what's called the Whitney numbers of second kind. So these are the numbers of, let's say, k-dimensional subspaces spanned by subsets of that set E. And the conjectures are, um, well, these Whitney uh, numbers are top heavy. So this is the same kind of feature you saw already for the Betty numbers of varieties which have an algebraic cell decomposition. And they're also unimodal, right? So um, these are the two conjectures that um, I think are best suited for an application of um, hard left for intersection cohomology. And as I said earlier, right, so the, the principle for solving this kind of conjectures in combinatorics is to come up with a geometric space that realizes these numbers as Betty numbers or something related to them, and then use Keller package information to deduce this kind of inequalities. So this is my last slide here. So this, uh, in the realizable case, uh, this result was proved by uh, Jun Ha and Botong Wang using this lemma I mentioned and their construction is, well, based on prior work of Ardila and other people who constructed the geometric space whose Betty numbers are exactly those uh, Whitney numbers of second kind. So the second, sorry, the even cohomology is given by these Whitney numbers and the odd cohomology is uh, zero. Well, <clears throat> we'll see in a minute why this is true, at least for the odd cohomology. And to define this space, um, construction is, is, is also quite easy. You simply regard these elements VI as maps from the dual space, the dual vector space of V to um, complex numbers. Just put them all together. You get this map, uh, which I call IE, from V dual to affine space of dimension D. Embed this affine space of dimension D in CP1 to D, so each C uh, is completed to a CP1 and then take their products. And you get a map from the dual of your vector space to CP1 to D, D being the number of vectors in the set E. The variety X is just the closure of the image of, of F. Um, Nice work by uh, Ardila and Bucher show that this variety has an algebraic cell decomposition. So the odd Betty numbers vanish, of course, but the nice thing is that the uh, number of cells in degree K are exactly this uh, Whitney numbers. So this shows the top heavy for the top heavy property for this uh, sequence WK. And if you want the uh, unimodality, you just, you do exactly what I did earlier, but using the unimodality of intersection cohomology Betty numbers. I'm done. Let me just say that this was actually proved, this was 
proved more recently for matroids, for all matroids, not just realizable matroids, by the group of uh, Braden, uh, Matern, Proud, Foot, and Wang, by essentially doing combinatorially what geometry tells you to do, right? So they de develop this combinatorial theory that mimics geometry. Thank you. <laughs>